There it is, folks. Pyre, one of my favorite songs from I can't remember who the artist is, but I just love I just love that song. It's stuck in my head and you know, if I knew who the artist was, I would I would tell you guys, but I don't it I was it Eric Clapton? Is that <laughs> is that who that is? I paid him to say that. <laughs> That was by none other than Eleanor Goldfield. Of course, that's just a little taste, but you can get the full... Oh, no, that's the whole song. <laughs> yeah, the full song. That'd be amazing. You put out an EP and it's just five-second songs. <laughs> well, you know, my old band, actually, we never released it, but we wrote a song called ADD, and it was 45 seconds long. <laughs> and it was about how like nobody has the energy to listen to a whole fucking album anymore <laughs> and how frustrating that is. And how many people... Skip to the, even though they liked the song, skip to the next song before it was over, not knowing it was 45 seconds. Well, since we never released it, I'll never know the answer to that question. But I, my assumption would be that it would be many and that thereby fulfilling the irony that I was going for. Anyway, because you're humble, I think you tried to change the subject. That is Pyre from Eleanor's new solo album called No Solo. And you can get it at artkillingapathy.com. But let's, yeah, we got a lot of great topics for you guys. This is Common Censored. I'm Lee Camp, joined by Eleanor Goldfield. Hello. And this, <laughs> that was said like a supervillain. <laughs> and this is the show where we talk censored stories and people, sensible solutions, and common ground movements to fight and build. And sometimes other stuff. And yeah, we got a lot of, a lot of important stories for you this week. I think maybe we'll just launch right in. Dive right in. Because it is the anniversary, uh, we, a few days ago was the anniversary of the death of George Floyd, many in the mainstream media are talking about, you know, what has changed, and, and there are mainstream media reports about how not much has changed in policing. Of course, ironically, the mainstream media can be, you know, about 50% at fault for that, because if they were to continue to cover the urgency of requiring those changes, then you would probably see large, more large scale changes across the country. So and of course, they they're, they're both at fault. And they're like, why are we seeing changes? They haven't covered the fact that since George Floyd's death, the police have killed like, I think it's almost a 1000 people. Yes. So, well, that's their, that's their norm. Well, right. I'm, a I'm, a year. I'm not saying that that's unusual. I'm just saying that that is what's going on. So it's, it's usually two before breakfast. <laughs> and then if they can get that done, then they know the rest of the day will be a little easier. Because if you, <laughs> if you only get the one done before breakfast, then it really is uh, qu- quite a lot to get done with the rest of the day. Also, we're not going to cover this because we are, are... Wow. Let me... That sentence d- decided not to... <laughs> yeah. Lee covered this on the last redacted, so we're not going to cover it here. But do yourself a favor and go watch the latest redacted because Lee talks about the quote unquote police reform vis a vis body cams and how fucking stupid that is. And this is like typically the response, right? It's either absolutely nothing or it's this bullshit that doesn't actually address the root cause, the root problem. Because of course, if it did, then the police would be like, oh, I'm out of a job. So right, they, we, they throw the, this bullshit out there like, oh, we'll have body cams or, oh, we'll have an accountability uh, you know, committee or something like that. But that uh, accountability committee is then run by the cops. So it's, off, it, it's, it's like a big fossil fuel company being responsible for reporting its own oil spills or something, right? So it's, it's these quote-unquote reforms that actually do fucking nothing but – they serve to try and get the public off of their backs for a bit so they can continue to murder people without any accountability and often, as Lee points out, without even fucking body cam. Yeah, they they often don't turn on the body cams. Yeah, so I get into that on Redacted tonight. But I do want to get into the changes that have happened across the country. And actually, we will talk a little about those community councils or accountability councils or whatever that seem to have very little impact, but some things are having impact in, in certain cities. And so this article was put together by Vox, V-O-X, which is a standard neoliberal kind of garbage outlet. However, as with Huffington Post, every once in a while they let a journalist go out and do something important, and then they bury it, you know, in the back of their website, and then they can point to it and go, look, we covered changes in policing. We did it. Oh, you just have to type in vox.com backslash other things (laughs) slash stuff that's hidden slash 
policing slash never mind <laughs> slash also policing. If you just type that in, you'll find it immediately. <laughs> so occasionally they have a good article, and this seems to be a pretty good rundown of the progress that has been made in just a few cities in America. Most cities have not done shit. <laughs> shit. Uh, because, you know, you, well, you know all the reasons. We've gone into them a million <laughs> times why our police own our system and uh, who they're working for. But so this Vox article gets into the cities that have kind of achieved the most. And so I want to just kind of read through some of them. Let's see, where's the... Well, more than 20 of the US, U.S.'s largest cities voted to reduce their police budgets in 2021. Seattle cut about $70 million dollars from its police budget and has pledged to allow citizens to decide how some of that reduction will be spent. New York eliminated about 500 million, though it may increase the department's budget for 2022. Yeah. Take that New York fact with a (laughs) fucking giant grain of salt. And San Francisco has pledged to reallocate $120 million in the next two years. And, yeah, the New York thing is, like, they claim they had cut a billion from the city's budget, but, in fact, $500 million was from school policing, which they just replaced with other policing agents that weren't technically police. So it was like, it was like, yeah, we're going to decrease the police. We're going to change their outfit to a different <laughs> hat. It's got a, they got a different hat. The city has committed, so the, uh, the city that has committed the largest cut is Austin in August 2020. The city council there agreed to remove $153 million from the Austin Police Uh Department's 2021 budget, a reduction of about one-third. So that is huge if they don't do like New York did and just reallocate that in, you know, find the resources elsewhere so that they can keep the cops as big and oppressive as ever. However, this gets into what Austin's doing in place of that. At the moment, about $108 million of that money has been allocated to two tranches. One is $31 million fund focused on distributing money to organizations and programs aimed at decreasing the need for police. That's kind of important. For instance, the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance, an organization that supports those working with substance abuse, said her group recently received money from the fund. The other $76.6 million fund covers civilian oversight of police mm-hmm. and helps make certain agencies in, and helps make certain agencies independent of the police. I think that's oh, it helps a really make certain in- agencies independent of the police. I think that's a really key point because. I think it oftentimes goes undiscussed <laughs> how 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 much the police control in terms of their account their quote unquote accountability, which of course you can't hold someone accountable if they're unaccountable. So, but <laughs> <laughs> but for instance, these oversight committees are oftentimes run and staffed by police. There's there's another point that you'll get to in a second, but. A podcast that I listened to not that long ago pointed out that forensic labs are part of police departments. So they have a vested interest in getting the guy that the police want them to get and of twisting the evidence to ensure that the cops get an arrest, right? They don't want to come back and be like, I've got nothing for you. They'd rather come back and be like, hey, we can close this up. It doesn't really matter if this guy's guilty or not, whatever the fuck. Like, let's just shut this and go get a drink because we're on the same team, right? So the importance of separating... Right, we grabbed a gang member that we wanted to capture for other things. We don't have anything on him, but we can just pin it on him and be done with it. The importance of separating these these entities is so vital. Like it's, it it really, I really can't (laughs) overestimate how important that is. And I I think we've talked about this before, but just the forensic labs in in general are so not what it looks like on CSI. They don't look like fucking spaceships and the, 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 the the quote unquote match of the fingerprints is not one in 2 billion. It's Hold on. I know that when you feed a bite mark into a computer, the computer then brings up a 3D model of the teeth that bit into that bite mark. (laughs) And then there's little blue squares that show up (laughs) around various points on the teeth. And then it goes boop, 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 boop. 
and then there's lines that come off those blue squares, and they have little words that you can't read because the uh, show's going too fast. And it goes, <laughs> boop, 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 boop. and then you see a bunch of faces scroll by as the computer is figuring out which one of those faces fits with this 3D model of the teeth. And that goes, boop, doop, 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 doop. and then it goes, boop, and it bings on a guy uh, who looks pretty gnarly, and he totally did it. Yep. That's Absolutely. how that works, right? that, And that's how it works for fingerprints. But the interesting, I know I've said this before, but I'm just going to reiterate it because it's so fucking mind boggling. You think at least with fingerprints, right? Because everybody talks about how, you know, you have your very own fingerprint. They are literally like your own DNA. It's specific to you. I bought mine at you. a county fair in Poughkeepsie. <laughs> you know what? I'm sure there's a black market for fingerprints, actually. Um, but but you, we, we oftentimes don't think about the fact that there's at a crime scene, even if there's a pr- fingerprint, it's not like this perfect. It's not like when you go to the, 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 the DMV and yeah. well, I was going to say the police, but yeah, whatever. Or, you know, when you sign up for TSA pre-check or whatever the fuck you, and you actually like put this perfect indentation of your fingerprint in that little ink. That's not how it usually shows up at a crime scene, right? right. You're not sitting on the, on the counter with the dude's blood being like, do, do, do with your fingers. And if you are, that's wow. But so they've got like a partial and so they put that in the database and it shows up with oh it could be like you know potentially hundreds of different people and you know then you can you can say that certain people are off the list because they live in fucking thailand or something uh but you don't actually have this perfect match that shows up and it's like oh it's definitely steve that's not how it (laughs) fucking works hold on i thought the computer started going steve 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 (laughs) steve 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 you know the steve alert you know (laughs) So, yeah, it, it, the forensics has so many problems. I mean, we'll probably do another episode down the road on some other area of forensics that is garbage. But anyway, I so I figured I'd skip, to the, skip in this article down to the civilian oversight part because we we're talking about it, and then we'll go back to some of the other stuff. But so this, this Vox article says, also ongoing is the work to provide greater oversight to local police through police accountability boards. It's a task activists have been hard at work at for nearly a century. <laughs> yeah, you know why it's been going for a century? Because very little of it does much. Because the cops have about a billion different ways to avoid this shit. In theory, these committees, which are often staffed by community members with no ties to law enforce- enforcement, can improve, you know, if it's set up well, they should have no ties, can improve the quality of local policing through inquiries into misconduct by issuing police recommendations, which they just totally listen to, and by <laughs> conducting reviews. You know, that's, uh, that's how a police sergeant is. Hold everything, folks. We got a note here that says we did something wrong. It's, everybody everybody, sit down and be quiet. Let's discuss this. It's kind of like the UN, where the UN goes to the US and it's like, you know, I just feel like you're being kind of dickish. I think you should lift the blockade on Cuba. And the US is like, <laughs> really, you do? That's fascinating. Thanks for stopping by. And then they go, let me jot that down in my notebook. And they <laughs> pin it in the open air without a notebook. <laughs> let me, I'm just going to, yeah, no, I'm writing this down. Totally got it. <laughs> Uh, in practice, however, boards have historically run up against limitations, you don't say, no. that infringe on their ability to affect meaningful change. University of Chicago law professor blah, 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 outlined <laughs> the most common, you don't need her name, the most common of these limitations in a 2020 study. Some issues include the fact that in many localities, boards are required to be advised by the city's legal counsel. These same lawyers who are defending cities and their departments against misconduct lawsuits. So the same lawyers that defend the city are also the ones who advise these councils as to what they're allowed to do, what they what, you know, what they'll do that actually matters, that kind of thing. And many boards lack subpoena power, lack forced. uh, Oh, sorry. Forced instead to do their work using whatever testimony and documents departments agree to provide. So, again, they're just like at the hands of the cops. It's like, could you please give us those files that show you fucked everything up? Yeah, we'll get right on that. Let us. okay, we're sending that over in this imaginary post box that doesn't (laughs) exist these are just the same limitations that have led committees with relatively narrow abilities like those in nashville chicago and new york that can recommend discipline following accusations of misconduct but that cannot mete out the discipline 
or boards like those in Tampa, Baltimore, and Buffalo, which can suggest policy but cannot institute it themselves. Then what is the fucking point exactly. of having a little council of citizens going, we'd really like it if you just stop killing so many people? And then the cops being like, what? I can't hear you. I'm going to go back to killing people. But it's this is this is how this system works, right? It reminds me of Nancy Pelosi's Green New Deal committee, right? Th- that was staffed by people who took giant donations from fossil fuel companies. Then they had no actual power anyway. So they could, you know, the idea was, oh, you can come with all of these great ideas for a livable future and then we'll totally ignore them. But at least we get to point to you and say, hey, uh, look at this. We care, right? which is exactly what the Democrats do, right? And this is, you know, another one of those quote unquote reforms. That means absolutely fucking nothing. These politicians get to go up in front of a big press conference and say, look, we really care about the, uh, the, the, the police brutality that's, that's happening in our community. And that's why we put together this, uh, this committee. Now they have no actual power. Uh, so nothing will actually change, but we get to point to them every now and then and say, look, we give a shit. And that's exactly what they do. That's what they're there right. for. Someone, someone else should do a study on how often police in a city have changed their cha- changed something significant based on a recommendation from civilian oversight. Oh, committee. that'd be great data. I'm, I'm sure it would look like <laughs> 0.2% or something. <laughs> it's like, well, they did start wearing a rainbow flag pin on next to the body cam. So that was that came from civilian oversight and a recommendation that really has had a big f- effect with the community. It started using compostable. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bodies. <laughs> they started composting Wait, their bodies. Are bodies not usually compostable? Well, it depends on where you put them. Because my plan all along has been to compost the rich. So if that if that doesn't work, it, I need it, to But know. it all depends on where you... If you put them in a plastic bag, then you negate the compostability. Oh, see, no, I wouldn't do that. I, you know... I want all the worms and the maggots. And the, <laughs> that, that's yeah, part why, of... Why seal off the maggots? Part of my plan. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the police department in Los Angeles agreed to start putting the bodies in a compost bin because they, they'd been leaving it in the dump and that's just a wasteful. Exactly. All right, so to get back to some of the changes that have been made other than civilian oversight committees, this is a quote from uh, Texas Harm Reduction Alliance now we have an independent forensics lab, we, which you were just talking about. We mm-hmm. now have a standalone 911 call center that isn't run by the police department. That's also crucial because people call the police for a million things. And we've talked about this before, but call the police for a million ridiculous things. You know, music's too loud. I can't. I've got, I'm lost. Uh, I, there's someone who's wandering down the street, and I don't know. Something about him. He just black kinda, people are barbecuing. He, yeah. <laughs> black people are barbecuing in a spot where I was under the impression you needed a license to barbecue. <laughs> I thought you needed a specific sandwich license in that area of the sidewalk. So it's that kind of shit. Or, or literally, like, I see a guy and he seems to be lost. So please send men with guns. So having 911 separate from the police department is fucking crucial. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't work well together if you're going to have a police department, obviously. If, you know, and we've talked about police abolition. But if you're going to have one, then yes, obviously they need to work well together with the police. But they shouldn't be run by the police. So then Austin Council member uh, Gregorio Cesa told me uh, it's uh, Kesar. Sorry, I said Cesar. Just yesterday, we voted to double our family violence shelter capacity in Austin using the reinvestments from the police budget. Over the course of the last few weeks and months, we've purchased housing for folks experiencing homelessness. We're hired. We've hired mental health first responders. So now if you call 911 in Austin, you hear, do you need fire, police, EMS, or mental health? So... These are fucking crucial things. And we've talked about mental health, mental health uh, uh, groups or, or organizations. One of them was in Portland, that, and I think maybe one in Denver, that you can call and get mental health professionals that don't arrive with guns, that aren't fucking idiots with you know, no necks, that <laughs> actually show up and help people that have mental health issues rather than showing up and often shooting them. So that change is like fucking step one. And I will say that DC has announced a similar 
pilot program? Oh, please send those people to Congress because <laughs> Congress needs some mental oh health. Oh, my God, that's brilliant. Can I actually make a call and ask them to <laughs> visit Congress? Because there's some serious crime happening there and some serious loony <laughs> fucking... Hap- yeah. Anyway. Lo- loony fucking happenings, yeah. actually. <laughs> loony fucking happenings. So... Uh, DC, this, this, uh, was announced kind of like a week ago. The DC police will start in June, a pilot program where DC police will not be the first responders to some mental health calls in the city. So this is something that folks have called for here quite a long time as well. And although it's, I mean, it's still very much tied to the police and there is no separate phone number, which is something that, you know, other, other places, other cities have instituted so that you don't actually have to even call 911. You can call the separate number altogether and say, Hey, I would, you know, I need some mental health professionals to, to come to this, this scene. But for now it's still tied to 911. You will basically call in and depending on the situation, there will be unarmed teams of <laughs> mental health experts that will be available to go to a specific, uh, you know, scene or action or not action, but event, perhaps a, uh, a, a difficult event situation, S- uh, event thing? situation, event situation thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Y'all I'm wow. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, and this is actually something that was pushed in particular. I mean, I, people have been working on it for quite some time, but it was pushed in particular in the past year since George Floyd's murder. So this is, again, an example of what people can achieve by really pushing hard. And of course, this is not a defunding of the police. Actually, I, I believe DC's police budget has gone up since the murder the, of George Floyd. There was, and Congress was just including Democrats, was just pushing for more money pumped into D.C. police to fight against the next insurrection. Oh, wait, that's separate. That's a separate issue? That's a separate thing. We'll get to that in a second. Because this is... So D.C. has So you, we're almost, talking local as opposed to federal for a moment. D.C. has almost 40 different law enforcement agencies in the city. And it, like... So when wherever you go, there's a different... So, you know, if you're down by the mall, that's the park police. And then you go to the White House, that's Secret Service and uh, DHS. It, it's, it's just... And then if you step on the street, though, that's MPD. But if you, step Hill on the, police. if you step there's, on the sidewalk that's on the Capitol, that's Capitol Hill Police. So it's just... There's it's postal a fucking police. mess. There's the... the, uh, the who tells you to pick up your dog turds? There's, <laughs> there's those fellas... So it's a clusterfuck here in DC and they, they obviously they work together too. So you'll be at an action and oftentimes there will be police from, you know, 10 different law enforcement agencies, all with separate quote unquote jurisdictions that, that very much overlap. And they're all just looking for one issue that they can get you for. So it's, it's a fucking mess here. Uh, but so that story is separate and I'll get to that in a second. But, uh, so this, this, this new pilot program uh, is something that's been pushed by folks, particularly in the last year. And I'm very interested to see how it goes. I'm interested to see if it actually (laughs) is used because again, since it's tied to the police, I'm curious to see how often they actually say, Oh yeah, we won't go to this situation. We'll send people who are unarmed and have, you know, degrees in dealing with, with uh, mental health and behavioral issues. So a lot remains to be seen, but I think that the fact that this is, uh, that this pilot program is happening is in fact a good sign. And I also just want to point out that on the other side of things, you have Fox News doing endless, breathless reporting on how crime's gone up, on how the, you know there's more homicides in New York now, and they're trying to blame it on the defunding of police. This is something I, I tore apart one of their segments recently on Redacted. But, of course, most of the cities they're pointing to where the homicide has gone up or crime has gone up, it, those cities have not actually yet defunded their police. They might have votes that have like, oh, next year we're going to do it, or like in New York where they claim they were going to do it and they've hardly actually decreased police budget at all. So while Fox News is saying, the homicides went up in 2020 because of defunding police, it's bullshit. Mm-hmm. And 
the main reason for in, an increase in crime is because people are desperate. People are desperate because the pandemic shut so many things down. It made people jobless. And, you know, the, the amount that they've gotten from unemployment or from their little $1,400 checks was not enough to fund their life for the next year. So people get desperate and they end up doing desperate things. But lest we forget, cops are still stealing more shit than burglars. So <laughs> By civil asset forfeiture, yes. Yes, indeed. So, yes, this next story uh, is something that happened last week. And <laughs> so y'all might remember that the uh, on January 6th of this year, there was a, uh, a dumb shit convention outside the Capitol <laughs> that eventually found its way in the Capitol. <laughs> Um, folks have called it an insurrection, a fucking riot, a, I just call it a dumb shit conve convention because that's really what it was. So the response to that has been, so first of all, I think it's important to note that there have been, since that happened, Congress has branched off in like dozens of different like subcommittees and sub, sub, subcommittees to those subcommittees about what happened and why it happened. And there's so this push that we have to figure out what happened we have to really we ha we have to do more in terms of surveillance and police budget that's all bullshit because of course what really happened is that the cops were told to just like stand down or not even show up or not even show up yeah so like if i know that i guarantee the congress members know that too but of course this doesn't tie into the whole the you know the the shock doctrine aspect of using this to promote, you know, mm. more militarization of police, more police, more control, more surveillance. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> so this is uh, something that happened last week again, and basically the <laughs> the Dems, because you know that was considered to be like a Republican bullshit dumb shit convention, right? Uh, so the Dems actually pushed through a bill to raise the budget for the Capitol Hill police and security by $1.9 billion. Billion with a B billion as a in B. balls. <laughs> Uh, because they said, quote, that the, 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 the actions of January 6th show that they need more funding. Now, now, think about this for a moment, which there's a lot of aspects of this that are important, but I just want to <laughs> harp on this one for a minute. A lot of what, quote unquote, went wrong that day was certain areas of police or other agencies telling cops to stand down. Certain areas not sending in reinforcements. So you've got 12 guys trying to fend off thousands. And cops that were sympathetic to the cause being like, yeah, come on in. So these, many of these cops were part of the fucking white supremacist dick balls that wanted to, you know, take over the Capitol. So you know that and you're like, I think we should give them a billion more dollars. Yeah, you know those dick balls that really just led like the fucking guy with the bison horns into the Capitol so that he could take a piss at the uh, in the Senate chambers. Uh, well, let's give that guy lots of money. Those those guys lots of money because really they need more money. They need more guns to because then they can facilitate that kind of thing quicker. Right, exactly. The, more the, the welcoming committee will right. be a bit better. Maybe they'll have little gift bags. Right, or velvet robes. There actually were velvet robes. You remember <laughs> that? The, all the people streaming in through the velvet robes. Oh no. It, there's so there's like a video camera right inside the Capitol, which is where also like tourists and things come in. So they had velvet ropes where you walk between to walk into the Capitol. And there's video of this mob that has now gotten in. And for a while, they all walk perfectly down these velvet, wow. little velvet ropes. And then finally, a few people come in and like kind of knock them over. But for a bit, they were like, well, listen, you got to stay inside the velvet <laughs> ropes. I mean, I mean, listen, if we're going to if we're going to kill all the blacks and Jews, we need to do it within these <laughs> velvet ropes. Don't walk outside that. Once you once, once you break into the place, you got to wipe your shoes at the front door. I mean, you just I mean, have some common courtesy. Uh, yeah. So. So this and, and, and again, like. D.C. has something like 40 different law enforcement agencies. The problem wasn't that there weren't enough people to call. The problem is that nobody felt like fucking calling them. So, yeah, it's just it's it's absolutely absurd. And uh, and I'm, I'm reading a, 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 a tweet by um, by someone who 
was talking about this this vote and said, quote, this is part of a long pattern. Police work with liberal reformers to use their own violence, waste, brutality and incompetence to justify increased budgets, which is kind of like what we've been talking about. Right. There's there's these quote unquote reforms that do nothing but actually bolster the police's ability to have qualified immunity, which means that they don't have to be held accountable for anything uh, that uh, allows them to kill people with more impunity while Democrats get to point out and be like, look, we have a we, we started a committee or we started body cams, and so we've done our part. Yeah, fa- famously the past week, because I've, I've noticed this on mainstream media, Jim Clyburn, who I think it's important in this moment, is a black representative in Congress. He, in these... In these compromises on getting this thing through, giving more money to Capitol Police and shit like that, and other other changes to police nationally, he said getting qualified immunity did not need to be a requirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, getting rid of qualified immunity. So, as the Dems go through their compromise procedure, they they have now, I believe, already wiped out the the hope of getting uh, of removing qualified immunity. Well, and this this was. they pointed to the the trial of Derek Chauvin and said, look, because because this person was found guilty, then we don't really actually need police reform, right? Because the system seems to be working fine. So qualified immunity doesn't need to be on the table because, look, Derek Chauvin was found guilty. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, the people that killed... Tamir Rice or Eric Garner, or all, all of these people, none of them are in fucking prison. They all no. got qualified immunity. Right. So, again, like this is this is how the, the Democrats in particular work. The Republicans never even bother trying to do reforms. They're at least honest about their assholery. The Democrats pretend that they want reforms and then they say, oh, well, look, the system seems to be working fine because Derek Chauvin's in jail and that applies and his guilt should just assuage every other person that's been murdered by police. So sit down and shut up. Uh, but getting back to this, this, this push by the Dems to increase the Capitol Police budget by $1.9 billion, I'm very sorry to say that it passed. And here's who we have to thank for that. The bill passed by just 213 to 212. That's one in the House. AOC, Tlaib, and Bowman voted present. So if they were one, there. Right. That's we what know that they means. were there. If one of the three members who voted present had voted no, the bill would not have passed. Wow, that's all. So all it took is, what did you say, one of them? One. One of those three pieces of shit just had to vote no instead of... You shouldn't even be allowed to vote present. That's fucking stupid. You either vote yes or no. You have to have an opinion. That's why you're there. You're there in Congress to have an opinion on legislation, you absolute dregs of society. How dare you vote present? Yeah. It's just so fucking dumb and it, it, infuriating. They, they should basically voting present should be called voting unaccountable. Voting like, unaccountable I'm, I, I'm, and spineless. I'm I'm unaccountable. I you know I, I, what I do doesn't matter here. Don't look at me. And <laughs> and the reason that the present vote exists is for political theater. It's so that AOC can go to Mama Bear Pelosi and say, look, I didn't vote no on this. I'm still in your good graces. That's the only reason that fucking vote and, exists. And the, and the reverse. So she can go to people like you and me or whatever, the left, the, the left people in this country, and say, I didn't vote yes on that police bill. So she can do both. Right. So It should and, be called having it both ways. I'd like to vote have it both ways. And yet, of course, if you have a fucking brain in your head, you would look at that and you'd be like, you just, that's bullshit. You just totally fell in line with the establishment and voted to fund the police as opposed to defund, which is what we demanded that you did. So 
and we're not going to go off on this big train about the squad. Fuck the squad. That's that, that's all I have to say about that. And if you if, if 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 there's something different that you feel about that, show me show me the legislative history that proves my comment is uh, is is untrue. Yeah, my my feeling is I'll go on the action that I agree with. If I see them actually do something that I think is important and I agree with it, then I'll be like, I'm glad they did that. I'm not going to just fawn on everything that this one group of people does because they are that group of people like the hero worship has got to stop y'all it really does <laughs> it helps no one and in fact it only weakens our ability to organize because we keep looking up to these people who have already sold their minds and their souls to the establishment and we're begging them for crumbs when they're holding on to the whole fucking loaf it's completely it, it's a waste of time and energy uh so please stop doing it <laughs> And before we move off of policing, policing, I wanted to say something else that's in this article about changes in certain cities, uh, especially Austin, because I'm sure some of you in Austin are like, this article's bullshit. It's not different here than it used to be five years ago. The cops still suck. And the article does kind of reference that. So the, many Austin activists say that things have not gone far enough or have not really changed much at all. Grassroot, l- grassroots leadership's criminal justice organizer David Johnson pointed out that the city has voted to further criminalize homelessness again. After city residents voted to ban public camping, city residents, so I guess that means it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a ballot a vote? initiative. And Graziani noted, I'm not sure which person that was, but anyway, <laughs> Graziani noted that many of the homeless Austin residents she works with have, ha- have not had p- positive experiences with the homeless services on offer. A significant amount of the money set aside for reallocation also has not yet been spent on those services. And here's a quote from my old friend Graziani who I don't know who that is. The <laughs> quote, the headlines would make it seem as if we're one of the model cities when it comes to defunding the police. It's a lot of headlines without a lot of substance. So the question is whether that amount of money, which it's up to close to a third of the police funding, whether it will A, actually decrease what police are doing, or will it just, you know, maybe decrease salaries but not actually change the way they're policing. And... Secondly, will that money actually go to create real change as opposed to, uh, yeah, we're going to have a homeless service that'll come by and say, hey, are you homeless? Well, we'll take you to a shelter where your stuff can be stolen. Like, yeah. it, so, so there's a lot of, the devil is in the details. And are you actually going to help the homeless? Are you actually going to make, uh, you know, give them places that they feel comfortable in? Or are you just saying, hey, we're going to add another room to this shelter where uh, women don't feel safe and everybody thinks their stuff will be stolen? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Uh, and this is something that this is something that p- people and activists and organizers have have uplifted before that it's not really just good enough to say, oh, we'll, we'll make more shelter space. Well, if your shelters are overrun with violence and, uh, and you know, theft and th- it's not, it's not staffed by people who understand trauma, uh, and mental health and behavioral problems, then what the fuck? You're basically just putting people into a giant cesspool of continued trauma and pain and suffering. So this is not good enough. So I think that it's, it's important to uplift that and talk about how we have to re- restructure how we how we address the issue of homelessness we can't just say oh it's enough to get them off the streets well where are you putting them are you putting them in a dangerous situation uh particularly for for women who have and and women who have kids like well what the fuck if you're you know you there are so many different and layered issues right. uh that that need to be addressed so you can't just say oh it's enough that we got them off the street technically if you put someone in a dumpster they're off the street but that's not good enough right so it's it's about actually again looking at root causes first of all what causes homelessness yeah i know um, this, <clears throat> this, this system should not have anyone with that isn't supplied with a home food clothing right and, you know, health And a friendly ferret that you can talk to in tough times. Mm. Can you chew? I, mm. Not a ferret. I mean, I'm not like anti-ferret. I just don't know that I'm pro-ferret. I think I would vote present on the ferret issue. 
Uh, have it the have it both ways vote. I have it both. I'm yeah. Because you don't want you don't want pro. the ferret lobby to come against right, you. Right to say that I'm anti ferret. I'm not anti ferret. I just I'm saying maybe I'd prefer a cat. I mean, if the ferret pack were to start funding your opponents, then yeah, it'd be pretty rough. Yeah, that, that's that's all I'm saying. If I could if I could choose a cat or maybe like a rabbit. Are you really gonna want to talk to a cat in tough times? The cat would give you those eyes like I don't give a shit. I know, but then I, this, somehow that makes me feel better. <laughs> How do you know how a ferret would respond? You don't know. Oh, they, they'd roll around in a ball or something. You have no, that, n- no. You That'd don't know that. would be adorable. Is that a little bow tie on? <laughs> a little bow tie? That's, okay, now PETA's going to come after you. That's animal abuse. It, de- it really depends on the color of the bow tie. If it's like a salmon bow tie, then yeah. Salmon? Yeah. I don't like anything salmon colored. Except salmon. Oh, I love salmon colored. <laughs> salmon colored salmon. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on. Moving on. So there's been some mutterings, again, on, on corporate media, just like this this person pointed out that, uh, you know, the headlines are awash with Austin is this this leftist dream city. Um, there have been some headlines that have been talking about how McDonald's is this dream job because they've decided to increase wages at their... Uh, at at the company owned restaurants to fifteen dollars an hour, or an average of fifteen dollars an hour. Devils in the details. So, <laughs> so there's a problem here because McDonald's only owns five percent of its restaurant locations. The rest are franchises that won't be affected by the wage increase. This is very similar to when was it and was it Obama said it initially but then uh, then Biden has picked it up about we're going to end privatized prisons, private prisons for the federal government. Right, and that's and like 5% or No, it's it's like 1% oh. or something. It is I uh, it's a tiny percentage of actual prisons that would not be privatized anymore but again like you get to say that you're doing something and you get to like put that fucking liberal feather in your cap so that's the first issue that it only applies to five percent of the restaurants and and, and okay so let's say that five percent of those people get fifteen dollar minimum excuse me minimum wage they don't it's an average wage what the fuck does that mean so the average wage means that will that at these corporate owned restaurants it will increase to thirteen dollars an hour and fifteen dollars by twenty twenty four and so <laughs> I mean there's so many fucking problems by twenty twenty four the dollar's not going to be worth anything we're going to be trading seashells at that point and you're going to be like <laughs> here's your fifteen dollars you're be like great I needed toilet paper so. And this, I'm, I'm reading from a, a Truth Out article about this that says, quote, uh, the, the company touting the average wage instead of the minimum wage means that the fast food chain could still pay some employees $11 an hour and pay others more to balance out the average while still bragging about the flashy and much vaunted $15 an hour figure. So basically, as long as they get to that $13 an hour average they don't have to raise certain wages, even at those restaurants that they actually own. So I'd say out of the 5% that they own, I don't even know, could it be 0.1% that are actually getting $15 an hour? I mean, maybe 0% because they said that it would be $15 average by 2024, which, and I think it's important well, to Average point- doesn't make any sense because you have managers that are making far more than $15 an hour, True. right? So another thing to point out that I think is important. You got Gus the chimney sweep who's getting paid in pogs. Meanwhile, there's a manager getting 80,000 a year and that averages out to $15 an hour for everyone. Pogs. Mm. (laughs) Uh, For anybody like below the age of 28 or something who has no idea what the fuck that word is, just Google it. It's, (laughs) It's a wild time. And so... So another important thing to bring up, I think, is that $15 an hour was the demand like seven years ago. The cost of living has gone up since then. I think we've all noticed. So really, $15 an hour is no longer even 
a survivable wage. So really it's like $20 at this point that you should, that you need in order to survive and actually have enough to cover the cost of living in this shithole country. (laughs) So it's not even like the demand, the, the, the fight for 15, I'm not knocking it, but I think like it's been going for so many years That $15 will eventually be won just because at that point, the (laughs) capitalist behemoths will realize, oh, well, that doesn't actually fuck us over at all because the cost of living has gone up so much that, yeah, sure, have 15. And then we'll celebrate and then we'll realize people are still dying uh, and people are still homeless and and, and, and struggling oppressively because $15 an hour does not fucking cut it. So... They can't even get to a survivable wage. Honestly, like the f- the extra fees on the extra fees on like going to a vet or like a hospital or taking a flight somewhere or getting a rental car, those are often eighty dollars. Like you'll think you're paying something and you get to the rental car place and they're like and they're like, Well, yeah, so we, we did quote you fifty dollars a day and then you just add on the rust proofing and the insurance on the rust proofing in case you were to find yourself without rust proofing at some point during the trip. And then the tax on the insurance on the rust proofing, that's eighty dollars. So yeah, your total comes out to one thousand nine hundred dollars for today. You said fifty dollars a day. Yeah. Well, plus fees. <laughs> Yeah. So, and 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 the, this article in Truth Out also points out that McDonald's has admitted in meetings with shareholders that fifteen dollars, uh, a fifteen dollar minimum wage wouldn't hurt their bottom line. So they've actually admitted that it wouldn't hurt them, and yet they're still not going to fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're at. Yeah, and I'm going to get into McDonald's and their history and everything more on an upcoming Redacted tonight. But for the most part, I'm not getting into the details of this $15, so I'm glad we covered it here. But that's a great point. And, and here's the thing is, like, this stuff is, this stuff is done by design. They understand how media works now. Corporate America does. They understand what's, what the tricks are. They understand what, where independent media lies nowadays. Uh, I didn't mean is lying. I mean, where it stands, (laughs) Where where it stands. And so they understand that when there is a large push to do something, whether it's to get treated better on an airline or to get $15 at McDonald's, they know ways to get even the independent media. Of course, the mainstream media is a fucking dumpster fire, so forget that. But they understand to get the, even the independent media to cover as if they have done it, as if people have achieved it. You know, much of the quote-unquote left media has been like, we did it, $15 an hour at McDonald's. Or, you know, we did it, the workers were unionized. And there's a lot of we did it's that are not actually real. I mean, you know, like we just said with the with the police changes in various mm-hmm. cities, it's it's arguable whether those changes are actually real and where where they will go in the coming year will probably actually tell us whether Austin's changes are real or kind of just uh, a shiny thing to distract people. But corporate America has this shit figured out. Right. It's 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 window dressing and it's window dressing that they realize is powerful for them. And I think this this brings up another issue that I that I've talked about before that it's a misconception that the system is very rigid in its dealings with 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 the the, the public, the proles, the masses, the unwashed masses. No, it's mm-hmm. super fucking malleable. Uh, it's very rigid in its you know systemic interests, like the the capitalist, colonialist, imperialist interests. It's very rigid in those, but it can dress them up in. Oh, so many wonderful colors and designs. Oh, yeah. Bruce Lee said, be like water. It's like corporate America is the best at that. Like you stick an obstacle in its way and it will wash around it, not try it, not always try and go through it. Some of the time it will. Some of the times it just kills the union organizers. But uh, a lot of the time they'll be like, yeah, we'll give you a union and we'll, uh, you know, cover up the fact that we actually own the people at the top of the union or whatever else. You know? Right. And so it, you know, it's like, it's like the black lives matter banners on Amazon's website or, uh, or, or the, the pride flags that are wrapped around bombs and shit. It's, 
corporate America and the machine of the United States is very, very, very good at adapting to, you know, the, the popular feeling of the moment. So they're very, they're very good at, at saying, oh no, we totally, we're on your side and we believe in human rights and da, da, da. And it's like, you just have to look beyond the window dressing because behind that it is an absolute shit show. It is, it is, the it is like third world country style oppression and living standards and it is just a colossal fucking mess but, but there's a really nice shiny mannequin up front <laughs> that's wearing like a really chic outfit and has access to health care and a minimum wage and all of this other shit and that's that's the front facing facade but you got to look beyond that and you got to understand but, that corporations are adept at this and they know exactly how to fuck with you but and they do it all of the time don't tell me it wasn't meaningful and heartfelt when gushers and fruit by the foot stood up for black lives okay, okay. can i when, just be honest when, when that gushers i really like gushers and fruit by the foot and the, and yet another reason to like them <sighs> when they tweeted that they were working together to fight for a less racist america and to to stand up for black lives i mean I mean, it, 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 I don't know. It brought a tear to my eye. And, and Gushers said Gushers would not be Gushers without black voices. And I don't quite understand why you would make a candy taste different in, if black people are or aren't around. Because to me, that seems a little racist. But, uh, you know, it was, it was heartfelt, I thought. It reminds me of when CBP, the, the Border Patrol, a.k.a. the Gestapo, posted on their Twitter an image of a Border Patrol officer holding a toddler. Oh, God, And yeah. said, we love our, our this agents. Was, this was in the midst of, like, riots there. What, not riots, but protests. and For stealing children at the border, basically. And they... Oh, we're talking about different things. Okay, go ahead. And they... Uh, well, this was... So, basically, Border Patrol, and the reason I call them Gestapo is because their job is to separate families. Their job is to put kids in cages and and put, you know, the 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 mothers and the fathers somewhere else. That's their job. And so there was this picture that they put up on their Twitter of of an of a CBP agent holding a kid that had like, you know, passed out from trauma, I assume. Uh and it was like some tweet that said something like we really appreciate our officers and their, you know, their varied skills to be able to care for children in the line of duty. And it's like, you stole that fucking kid, you monster. Well, you got, they, they're hugging them on the way to the cage, which is really nice of them. It's just absolutely, like, it is, it would be like if there was a picture in Nazi propaganda of, like, an <laughs> SS officer holding a Jewish kid and being like, we care. And... I mean, holy fuck. It is This little fella got lost on his way to the camp, so we're right. helping him out. <laughs> yeah. So never never forget to, you know, steal a phrase. Never forget how fucking malleable the Empire and corporate America are because they they know this shit. They know the PR very well. So the one I thought you were referencing, which is almost identical in terms of the the PR effort was it was during very active protests, I believe in Philadelphia, it was either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh for Black Lives Matter and the cops were doing their brutal repression. And there was a photo that went viral that the cops put up of a woman in her uniform holding a kid and like hugging a kid and or holding his hand, holding the kid's hand or something. And the the cops were put it up with a post that were like, we we're able to save this kid from the violence, get them out of the way of the violence or something like that and, and get them to safety. And then it came out. Others who were there said, no, we saw you rip that kid from its mother and arrest the mom. Jesus like, Christ. It was it, uh, witnesses had said, no, you didn't save that kid from violence. You, you, you stole it. You brought the violence and stole the kid. Right. Like, yeah. Isn't it sweet that these people kidnap children that's just the best are you looking for kidnappers who also can double as snipers then <laughs> we're the people for you <laughs> so in just these last few minutes let's talk about pretty exciting that lula da silva who was 
a much beloved president of Brazil than he was in order to stop him from winning again. And the U.S. oligarchy largely supported this. Wall Street Journal uh, boldly announced that they supported this. <laughs> boldly. <laughs> boldly announced that they supported fascist Bolsonaro. But in order to stop Lula from winning again, they put, imprisoned him in a completely corrupt court proceeding in which the judge and the prosecutor were working together to basically just make sure that Lula would be locked up so he couldn't run for president. And the truth came out, thanks to, thank goodness, to a leaker, to a whistleblower, which... You know, as as the mainstream media loves to say, you know, never be, never, ne you know, they love to d dump all this hatred on people who leak stuff, people who are whistleblowers. But yet again, we see it completely changing the course of history. A, a, a leaker revealed texts and emails between the prosecution and the judge showing the level of corruption against used against Lula, and it got him out of prison. It, he was freed, and now he has announced that he is running for president again. Yes, uh, he did provide some stipulations. He said that as long as... I want one ham sandwich a week. That's, that's not unreasonable. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 I think most presidents demand more. I want a lady presented to my office in order to clean the keyboard on my computer because it gets very dusty. Mm, wasn't going to expect that you were going there with that, but... <laughs> um, so... He said that, uh, quote, if I'm in the best position to win the presidential elections and I am in good health. And don't forget, he was stuck. Right in now, Bolsonaro is like, how can we make him sick? I know, right? Uh, he was stuck in prison. So, you know, and he's I don't know exactly how old he is, but, you know, he's no spring chicken. So I think that's that that's that that's a, a big condition there. But according to recent polls and that Brazil, spring chicken to my ham sandwich. <laughs> are you dead? Maybe. According to recent polls in Brazil, uh, the leader, Lula, who's the, the leader of the Brazilian Workers' Party, would defeat uh, Bolsonaro in both rounds. So they have two rounds of the presidential election. He would win in both, according to recent polls. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, in the first vote, it's estimated that he would get 44% of the vote compared to only 23 for Bolsonaro. In the second round, uh, the former president would get 55 compared to 32 so those are what the polls are saying right now. So it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's pretty, <laughs> it, 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 it's looking pretty good for him. I think it's also important to note, I'm not trying to rain on anybody's fucking parade here. However, Lula was not like some far left socialist right. dream. He was kind of more t like flirting than on the neoliberal edge there, I'd say. So I He's like a left wing you know, oligarch. Uh, apparently, those those in Israel say that the oligarchy actually did quite well under Lula, but even the changes he made was too much for them. So they, you know, worked together to get him imprisoned. Right. So I, he's definitely no Bolsonaro for sure, but he's no like Che Guevara. So I think you know important to just throw that out yeah, there. Yeah, on that sliding scale, there's a lot of room in the middle. Yeah, a lot, lot of room. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Bolsonaro versus a lot of wiggle Shigeru. room there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's something that's something to watch uh, because I mean, just looking at Brazil, particularly with the the handling of COVID um, uh, and the opening up the rainforest, the opening up of the Amazon for logging and for big ag is just atrocious. So, having someone in office that actually fucking believes in climate change and and, and science vis a vis either pandemics or I don't know the most biodiverse region on the fucking planet would be good i think that would be a good move uh so that is definitely something to to look out for and and watch yeah and also someone who doesn't despise gay people and yeah. indigenous people and indigenous people and women yeah um who doesn't uh basically celebrate rape which is what bolsonaro mm -hmm. does so anyway that is what we got for you today thank you guys for joining us the uh, there will be no live stream for i think two weeks because we have some travels we're involved in and shit like that 
but we will try to still bring you regular common censored common, common censored episodes. So please keep checking back for those. And I will still have an act out episode. Lee's still doing moment of clarity and government secrets, and of course redacted tonight. There's also a new episode of Silver Threads out. Uh, you can check that out wherever you get your podcasts so there's there's still stuff there's still stuff to listen to and to watch we're pumping out the stuff total <laughs> stuff it's total stuffage man that's pumping in isn't it if you're stuffing something stuff I, I just is this getting dirty i don't i don't want to get dirty no now i'm just thinking of thanksgiving turkey <laughs> thanksgiving is bullshit but the food i i enjoy the food there's, I'm uncomfortable with this much discussion of meat. <laughs> I, I realize I brought up the ham sandwich that Lula was going to demand, you but did. still, I, I am opposed to that. Okay, I'm fine. Opposed a a to tofurkey, then. Thank a stuffed you. stuffed tofurkey. Thank you. What are you stuffing it with? B- Obviously to- not bacon to- bits. To- to- fucking duckin'. <laughs> to- to- fucking duck. Fucking fucking duckin'. Firkin duckin. A merkin? M- merkins oh. and duckins. <laughs> fucking Shit. God damn it. This is why we can't get the whole family together. I thought it was cooked fine. It's a glimpse into Lee's life. <laughs> well, you just fill it with some fucking duck and then you're murking and then you're and, th- and then you're twerking. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. If you want to grab Eleanor's album, which I highly recommend you check out, it's at artkillingapathy.com. It's called No Solo. You can get a, a listen at on Spotify. However, please, if you like it, grab the album online because that's the only way you support artists, not at Spotify. So there's that. And I have a new website at leecamp.com. You can now watch Redacted Tonight straight off of leecamp.com. It, it, it used to be you had to click like two more buttons to get to some other website. Now it's a single click. Now it's a single click, which is Amazon's entire success model. Was people <laughs> don't like clicking twice because their finger gets tired. So if they just click once, the world will change. And it turned out they were right. We have gained so much more finger rest, really, like respite for fingers. And so much more destruction. And so much more destruction. Wah, wah. All right. Thank you, guys. Keep fighting. Act out.